Moving now into discussion items. Uh, the first discussion item is regarding new courses at Greenwich High School. This is the first read, Dr. Calabrello. Thank you so much. I have two program administrators at the high school that are going to present two new courses, Lucia Recco and John DeLuca. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, we can. Go ahead. Great. Good evening. I'm Lucy Areco, the Bella House Administrator and Social Studies Program Administrator. I'm very excited to present the new state mandated course, African American, Black, and Puerto Rican Latino Studies. The course provides an opportunity for students to learn about the accomplishments, challenges, intersections, and perspectives of African American, Black, and Puerto Rican Latino people in the United States. By taking this course, students will strengthen their own sense of identity and deepen their understanding of historic and contemporary tensions around race and difference. Ultimately, this course will allow students to become more engaged and informed citizens, which is in line with the mission and vision of the Greenwich Public Schools as outlined in the vision of the graduate. The State Education Resource Center of Connecticut, CERC, has written a detailed curriculum guide. As the state wishes for the student experience in the course to be consistent across districts, districts are expected to follow this guide with fidelity. CERC has included lesson plans and links to materials and resources for each day of the course. In the first semester, students will study African American and Black history. The second semester will focus on Puerto Rican and Latino history. I have linked the curriculum guide in the course proposal if you would like to read more specifically what the course entails. It is a year long social studies elective, which will include an honors option and it, it is open to juniors and seniors at GHS. Students will learn about the course in course selection meetings with their counselors, which will begin after the February vacation. And the social studies and English departments will also promote the course in their 10th and 11th grade classes. Please let me know if you have any questions. Okay, seeing none, let's have John present. Nice try, Dr. Carabella. Hold on a second. I was trying. I was trying to move it along. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I used to were behind. There's nothing we could do about that. Okay, Ms. Hirsch. Well, you answered one of my questions with, which was, did we take the CERC uh, curriculum and make any revisions to it? So thank you for that. Um, the other question I was gonna say is, you know, I know you probably will not have any idea uh, until this is uh, discussed with students, but how many sections of this do you uh, expect to possibly have? Um, and, uh, you know, what happens if we kind of go over that? I'm hoping we fill at least two sections. So that would be roughly 50 students that would sign up for the course. Um, if, you know, if there were more that, than that that signed up, that, that really doesn't, what, what would happen is this course is essentially gonna pull from other courses because 95% of our students at GHS take social studies for four years. So essentially we're gonna be drawing from electives that the kids would, would already be taking. Okay, thank you. Ms. Kowalski? Go ahead. So I'm having quite a night tonight because I left my glasses at home until my daughter came and my notes that I had taken on this particular thing. So I'm gonna have to wing it. <laughs> um, so just, I'm sorry, I'm, I didn't quite hear you. So the... Um, We've adopted the entire course, the full curriculum that CERC has provided that gave us the hyperlink. The answer to that was yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Why did we do that? Because we're required. Why are we required? I mean, it's, it seems to be very prescriptive. I mean, the state came out with like a day-to-day, -day, almost class-by-class -class designation of exactly what we should be teaching. And my concern with this particular class is if you read it in detail, it talks about um, 
I should go to the links, but um, it talks about basically in broad brush strokes, everything that we've said we're not teaching here, which is critical race theory. So I'm very concerned that we've one, not taken a pen to this particular curriculum, why we have to take it at, at directly from the state on this because we've stood here and we've heard administrators say over and over again, we're not teaching critical race theory. Well, that's exactly what this class teaches. This is required by the state, Karen, and we have to follow what the state uh, directs us to adopt. It's the same thing as adopting the 25 credits that are required now for graduation. We have to offer it. It does not mean that students have to take it. It is an offering. It is a, uh, an elective course, and we have to follow the requirements that the state has given us. Yeah, I, I find, I, I just, I find I'm, it's better that it's an elective class, but when you talk about this um, and the specific things that it teaches, um, you know, one of the particular things, and again, I wish I had had my notes in front of me because I wrote down and went through this, but it, it specifically talks about, um, it, it relates Columbus in 1492 to the current police brutality against Latinos. That's making a pre, you know, that's making a very bold statement right there. And it also talks about the um, systemic racism and it doesn't even ask the question, is there systemic racism? It just assumes that there is. And I just find this class to be completely out of line with what the Greenwich Public Schools, should, how it should be teaching. It should be having these discussions rather than presupposing that these things are actually happening. It also it takes a very hard line in policing in general. And I would find, in fact, we have a police officer standing in the back of our room here. If he found out and if he had taken a look at what they're teaching and how it's being done, I think he'd take offense to it as well. So, so I just, I find this, I just find this completely irresponsible and not something that should be happening in Greenwich. So the good thing, Karen, is that the state is open to feedback from all people, from parents, from students, and from educators. So that is something that we will be able to make sure that we put out so that teachers, parents, and uh, um, students can make comments about it over the next year. So I think that the feedback will be very valuable to the State Department of Education and we will be able to comply, comply with what they have asked us to do. So as soon as we get that information as to where you, we can give feedback, we will make sure that everybody has access to that. Sounds good. Can I, sorry, can we, can I, Mr. Kelly, are we going to No, that, that's fine. All I'd like to say is I'd actually like to audit this class so that I can actually provide feedback. I will carve out time out of my day to go to this class so I can provide adequate feedback to the state. Awesome. Very good. Good. Mr. Thank Kelly. Uh, my question is this. I understand that it's a requirement by the state to offer. Is it this class we're required to offer or is it a class that addresses uh, uh, African American, Black, Latino, and Puerto Rican studies. Right now, it is this class. That is correct. It's this class. You say right now. What does that mean? Well, depending on what feedback we get from uh, the state and from the teachers, parents, and students, they may make a different uh, outcome. But we don't know that yet. So, Anne, at this point, uh, we are required by the state to adopt this this class yes and if kids don't want to take it that's okay but we have to offer it so michael joseph yeah so 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 by this class just to clarify we mean this the scope and sequence that the state's developed right that day Correct. by day scope and sequence Correct. the um which surprised me um you know you read through that i mean in in four months time you know you're going from ancient african kingdoms to the present day with you know an african-american history and then you switch to latino it's um i mean it, I, it doesn't it doesn't surprise me because if you read through the document you see that it was drafted by a committee of over 100 people so it's very much a mile wide and an inch deep the um it is there 
are there is there any other example of the state mandating this kind of lockstep day by day curriculum? Do, do we have any other example of that in the school? Or is this is this a new state 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 invention? That I really would have to look into. I'm not sure. I don't know if Dr. Jones knows, but I am, I am just looking at, at what changes have been made since the new commissioner came on board and the new uh, director of academics. So I'm not really sure. I would have to get back to you on that. Because, because obviously we, we all know, anyone who's taught knows that any kind of quick, I mean, it's unrealistic. You can't plan out a whole term day by day, you know, before every student, <laughs> you know, classes change, things happen. So, Correct. so, so Correct. this kind of mandate obviously is, is, is silly from the start, but um, I do appreciate that it's, that it's an elective. I, and, okay. and it's an, and it's an important topic. The, um, this kind of, um, um, drill down the sp mm -hmm. uh, specificity on the day just just boggles my mind. Right. I look at it. I personally look at it at as more as a guide. But as we work through it, depending on how many students uh, choose to participate, I think that we will learn a lot about it, about what is appropriate and what is meaningful and what maybe we don't need to address as much. So I think it will be a learning experience for all of us. And I'm excited that uh, one of the board members wants to audit the course. I think that's great. And I think that we can get a lot of feedback and it will help us to move forward with what we want and what we think is important for our Greenwich community and students. I do have something, Kettle. Maybe just a fun thought for us is if the state can require us to teach a class that is maybe uh, intellectually lacking or perhaps even misleading to students, maybe we should consider having a critical thinking class or something to uh, encourage them to take if they're uh, if they're taking this elective uh, because they can't force us not to teach something at least yet. Uh, and crit critical thinking might be a helpful way to offset some of the stuff. These classes are obviously overly politicized and tend to have uh, social agendas associated with them that aren't academic or related to um, what schools should be teaching. So just something for us to consider as a way to counteract a heavy hand from the state here. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Pardon me? Yes, let's go to the uh, next class. Thank you. John, thank you, Lucy. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yep, you can. Go ahead, John. Okay. Hello, I'm John DeLuca. I'm the science administrator at the high school. Um, we are also proposing a new course, Honors Anatomy and Physiology. A thorough understanding of human body systems is a critical requisite for students considering careers in biomedical sciences, biotechnology, and pharmaceutical. Prior to 2019, GHS students gained this valuable learning in AP Biology. However, in 2019, the College Board made its second critical revision to the AP Biology curriculum in the last decade, essentially removing all anatomy and physiology from the course. While there's an on-level on human biology course offered at the high school, there is no honors level equivalent. Consequently, with the exception of one unit during freshman honors biology, GHS students currently have no opportunities to study human biology at the honors level. The proposed course would fill this significant gap in our course offerings. We are proposing a one semester honors anatomy and physiology course taught in the fall. Students taking this course will also have the opportunity to take honors biochemistry, a one semester course that will be taught in the adjacent spring semester. Honors anatomy and physiology will not serve as a prerequisite for the honors biochem. Currently, there are three full year honors science options for students at GHS in their juniors, junior and senior years. Honors anatomy and physiology would provide a fourth honors science course option for students who may be less advanced in math or who aren't interested in taking AP level courses. Furthermore, there is currently no appropriate class for students enrolled in AP Biology to drop into if they find the course too demanding. 
Typically a handful of students enrolled in AP Biology end up dropping the course within a week or so because of the intense workload. Honors Anatomy and Physiology would provide an appropriate course for students to move into. There are essential aspects of the Honors Anatomy and Physiology course that align with our vision of the graduate. These connections have been carefully planned by our teachers who designed the course. I would like to highlight one of these as just an example of the unique opportunity that this course will offer students. Students in the class will compete, complete a disease diary assignment completed for each of the units in the course. The expected student outcome of the work is for students to apply and integrate basic anatomy and physiology knowledge to clinical applications. Accessing reliable references and communicating in written form the information effectively to peers. Peer review will be a critical component of these assignments. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Ms. Hirsch. Um, thank you. I think this is uh, a class that a lot of students are really going to be interested in, as I'm sure there are a lot of students who are, you know, interested in going forward in uh, a medical career. But um, my quick question to you is, I know this is uh, noted as an honors course. Will it be offered at all as a non-honors? Um, I know you said that there are three full year honors science courses that are being offered, but um, I didn't know if this was something you were considering a non-honors option for as well. We currently have a non-honors version of this class already in our, um, our uh, course selection. So oh, thank you. I must have missed that when I read the, uh, the course guide. So never mind then. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Did you have a question, Ms. Downey? Okay, real fast. So then, Mr. DeLuca, just so I fully understand it. So right now, if AP biology was considered too challenging, where do they, they drop now just to general bio and then practical yeah, bio? Yeah, so, I mean, there, there are courses that they would drop into that really don't quite align with AP biology. Things like honors marine biology would be a good example, honors environmental science. Uh, this would be a much better fit. Got it. Okay. Makes sense. Uh, maybe I'll audit at this course. Thanks so much. <laughs> Great. Do you have a question? Could I just make a comment? I think this is a really fantastic idea and I just wanted to commend uh, whoever came up with it. I think it's, I like the responsiveness of recognizing that just because the AP test changed doesn't mean that the, you know, knowledge worthy of pursuing change and wanted to commend the, uh, you know, everyone involved for coming up with this. It's very cool. Thank you. We have Thank a great you. science department, I have to say. They're very good. One quick question. When um, we obviously have to get this on the next agenda uh, to vote on these two courses, because the course of study guide goes, I mean, kids are starting to choose their classes for next year, right? Correct. Correct. Okay, so we should, we'll move this one quickly to so, the next So one. do you just, um, into question, so do you put it in the course of study guide for pre-selection prior to a board vote, or how do you, you know, what's the mechanics of helping you guys out with that. We, we put in it in the course of study guide with fingers crossed. Yep. And if it's not approved, then we will cross it out. Right. <clears throat> sounds good. Okay. Thank you very much. It sounds like you're probably staying with us, Mr. DeLuca. Um, well, I'm sorry, you're not next though. Uh, right. First up is Mr. D'Amico for the K through eight STEM report. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Dr. Kilrabello and I are pleased to bring our collective academic teams to you this evening, uh, not only to showcase their outstanding efforts, but the efforts of our wonderfully talented Greenwich educators in the area of STEM. Leading off our presentation tonight is our director, uh, K-8 science coordinator, uh, Mrs. Tara Fogel. So, Mrs. Fogel. Thank you, Mr. D'Amico. Good evening. As Mr. D'Amico said, my name is Tara Fogel and I'm the proud program coordinator for K-8 Science. I'm fortunate enough to start us off tonight on behalf of my fellow coordinators in K-8 Math, 912 Math and Science. While there is a lot of detailed information in the written report regarding both math and science, we would like to remind our board and listeners this evening that we have covered K-8 Math presentations in previous board meetings. Mr. Mike Reed presented his Big Ideas update on Wednesday, November 17th and the accompanying report and corresponding slides from this presentation are available on board docs. With a packed agenda this evening, I'll be intentional with our time together. This year, I have presented on curriculum shifts, advanced programming in grades three to five, 
and NGSS achievement in grades five and eight. Tonight, I will talk to you all about four strategic levers for the ongoing evolution of the K-8 science program. Let's get started. Our four areas for work in the coming years are as followed. We will work to improve NGSS scores for students testing in grades five and eight. We will continue to focus on curriculum implementation with fidelity across our 11 elementary and three middle schools. We will revisit the structure of advanced science programming in grades three to five out and at the middle school to ensure it meets the needs of our students and community stakeholders. And we will maintain a dedication to innovation in curriculum and implementation for strong and sustained student outcomes. Now, a bit more about NGSS achievement. I am confident that we can see continued success and improvement on our NGSS assessments in the coming years as we transition away from the current COVID limiting factors. First, the grade five assessments. Our plan includes improving educator science content knowledge, starting with the grade five classroom teachers to build efficacy around disciplinary core ideas. We will follow this with strategic use of the interim assessment items and specialized supports in our schools where students have been historically disadvantaged. Supports in these buildings include modeled lessons by myself, our education consultants, and identified high performing teachers. I have already begun this work with an increased availability and access to myself as a coordinator at common planning time during program meetings after school and teacher choice program days. Looking forward to the grade eight NGSS test, I continue to work closely with the middle school science team across Eastern, Central and Western middle schools. I will provide specific training using our digital platforms based on teacher requests and curriculum needs. And we'll also work with the middle school team to utilize the interim assessment items to continue to prepare our students, not only for the content and skills presented on the NGSS test, but also comfortability with the user platform and the cognitive load it requires for navigation. The second lever, lever for change is adherence to the curriculum and implementation thereof. I use a collaborative approach, approach to this by working with building administrators as we visit K-5 classrooms during STEM blocks and plan for teacher needs during curriculum program meetings. At elementary schools in particular, we will implement pacing check-ins and structure the use of interim assessments throughout the year to gauge student growth at each grade level in grades three to five. At the middle level, I continue to work with my learning facilitators from each building to support curriculum implementation on a monthly basis. Now, for our third and likely most anticipated lever for change, it's the restructuring of our advanced science programming here. We will start this with identifying students in grades three to five for ALP science instruction within the STEM block. This change means that students will not be placed into science enrichment within grades three to five solely based on math scores as they currently are. We are excited about this evolution of the program as we know that some students can show a propensity for science outside of math or reading achievement. At the middle level, we are returning to homogenous classes and we are removing indep the independent projects. We're scaffolding an advanced curriculum in grades six through eight and providing multiple on-ramps to advanced science during each grade level, as well as between sixth, seventh and eighth grades. Now, let me explain how the on-level curriculum will differ from our advanced course. The plan for next year is to separate these two class levels. And in grade six, we will include advanced resources and enrichments and enrichment in the units of instruction. Students in advanced classes will master the same performance expectations as their grade level counterparts with the addition of more rigorous text and readability, length and content, the use of more complex data sets on our Tuba platform. And along with these content advancements comes the assessment criteria on rubrics that assess students' abilities in the eight science and engineering practices. We will assess these at the grade level performance bands above that of 6-8. In addition to this advanced curriculum, advanced students will engage in one intensive unit of instruction in school with their advanced counterparts in their classroom, which we will refer to as a seminar. This unit will be project-based, involve large opportunities for student exploration and choice, and includes content from the performance expectations currently in the on-level grade eight curriculum, but more about that in a bit. Let's move on to grade seven. This is similar to grade six. In addition to the advanced curriculum, advanced students will engage in two more intensive seminars. These again, involve larger, large opportunities for student exploration and choice, 
and more of our performance expectations currently in the grade eight curriculum, which is an excellent segue. With up to two years of advancement under their belts, eighth grade advanced science students will engage in a predominantly high school level science experience. The course no longer mirrors that of their on-level grade eight counterparts. Students now will complete four units of instruction, though only two of which will cover the remaining grade eight performance expectations in preparation of the six through eight NGSS exam. The other two units will look specifically at targeting performance expectations from high school science standards. The creation of these units will be completed in concert with guidance and support from Mr. John DeLuca, our 912 program administrator, as together he and I look to target performance expectations that may not be covered in general course offerings at Greenwich High School or tracks that students currently fall into. This interdisciplinary design of advanced science in grade eight allows for students to have their needs met with an alternative experience from their on-level counterparts. The curriculum will expand content knowledge and increase ability in the eight science and engineering practices all of which will be assessed using grade level N bands from the 912 standards. The design of the 6-8 advanced curriculum allows for multiple on-ramps where students who develop a curiosity of the natural world or a propensity for engineering throughout middle school are able to move up and into advanced coursework during grades seven or eight. The final and ongoing lever for strategic change is that of philosophy. I'm dedicated to staying abreast of evolving trends in science education. I remain connected to the broader education, science education community and continue to engage in personal learning in that arena. I bring my knowledge and expertise to the role of coordinator and promote the district goals of continued excellence in science education. In the coming years, as science comes back into focus on our broader curriculum management plan, we will improve student experience with more opportunities for hands-on inquiry, place-based learning, and field experiences outside of our classroom. As a board, you can expect to see a shift in the way we prioritize spending in science to align with this philosophy over the coming years. And in support of this, I am also dedicated to providing our K-8 teachers with meaningful and actionable professional learning. My goal is to keep teachers current, give them space to take, take risks and try new things, all while maintaining a steadfast dedication to strong student outcomes. We know that that starts at K-5, which covers it for me for now. Next up, I'm going to introduce Dr. Shanta Smith, who is excited to share about innovations just like the ones I mentioned currently happening at our STEAM Magnet School, Hamilton Avenue. We have forged a strong partnership in the past few months since my hiring, and I am excited to announce that I have already begun work to help out students there. We've scheduled two teacher trainings with her staff, as well as parent outreach sessions around their STEAM symposium. The work does not end there, and I'll let Dr. Smith explain more. Take it away, Dr. Smith. Thank you for allowing me this time to provide a brief update on the hard work of our dynamic Hamilton Avenue scholars, our exceptional educators, and our super supportive Hamilton Avenue school families. The question that you see on the slide really exemplifies part of our goal at Hamilton Avenue School. Next slide, please. During the fall of 2021, we focus on implementing big ideas in math. In the winter of 2022, we're implementing the STEAM Challenge Symposium launch events for students, staff, and families. Our first event for families is on January 27th. In the spring of 2022, we will host our first annual STEAM Challenge Symposium. The date is June 3rd. For the STEAM Challenge Symposium, Hamilton Avenue scholars will complete a problem-based learning activity by selecting a topic of interest within a specific STEAM framework. Scholars will complete challenges, research, reflect, create, design, and share, and present their discoveries at the symposium using a display method of their choice. Next slide, please. So far this year, we've accomplished many of the goals that we set last year. We planned our first STEAM Challenge Symposium, we hosted our first Hamilton Avenue School Family Academy. We launched our first Hamilton Avenue School Teachers Institute with training from Abbott. We also hosted COVID-friendly celebration of the arts outdoors and virtually. And the teachers are engaging in a peer review cycle of big ideas math implementation with our consultant, Dr. Todd White. So moving forward, we will continue to communicate and celebrate our successes through creative marketing of our magnet school theme to our stakeholders. 
we will also tailor our professional learning needs to meet the needs of the adult learners at Hamilton Avenue School. The coordinators have been great with facilitating that thus far. We will also maintain our current partnerships and we're hoping to expand and diversify our community-based partnerships to enhance our magnet school theme. And finally, our dedicated STEAM units of instruction for K-5, to we look forward to working with Ms. Fogel and Mr. Reed to help us with this particular initiative. Thank you for your time. John, you're up next. You're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you, John. <clears throat> So I'm gonna present uh, the uh, STEM report for 912. Uh, Greenwich High School offers a comprehensive and diverse science program that pushes students to succeed in the core courses of biology, chemistry, and physics, as well as a diverse array of elective courses that rival small colleges. Over the past few years, our department has worked hard to align with the Connecticut Next Generation Science Standards. In our classes, students engage deeply in the content they are taught how to pose scientific questions, design investigations, and communicate their findings effectively. Our goal is to inspire and challenge students so that they will become scientifically literate and engaged. <clears throat> In review of the 2020-21 academic year, one way to understand student success is to review the standardized tests. In science, this was the Connecticut NGSS assessment given in fifth, eighth, and 11th grade. In May of 2021, GHS students took the Connecticut assessment for just the second time, the first one being spring of 2019. 82% <clears throat> of the juniors met or exceeded expectations on the 2021 NGSS assessment. This is the exact percentage of students that met or exceeded expectations on the 2019 NGSS assessment. Because district by district scores were unavailable this year, it was uh, possible to compare our results against comparative districts. However, it's important to note that in 2019, the 82% value was the fifth highest in the state for high schools. Some reasons for our success uh, continues to be the, the GHS science staff implementing the aligned curriculum that we have. Our freshman and sophomore courses of biology and chemistry are aligned to NGSS. Students have choice how to explore science their junior year. These junior year courses of physics, marine biology, and environmental sciences are all aligned with NGSS assessment in their own unique way. We believe there really is a benefit here in allowing students this choice. Credit has to be given to the science staff for their creativity and deep content knowledge to develop these courses so that they maintain their core content yet delivered authentic connections between the standards and the content. <clears throat> Professional development and shared planning time continue to be key factors here in providing teachers the necessary time to collaborate and learn from each other. Grinch High School is also fortunate that because the curricula have been vertically aligned district-wide, high school students have had the longest exposure to NGSS-based curriculum. Another mechanism to measure success in science at GHS is by looking at our AP scores. Here, historical context is very important. All AP science courses were on a positive trajectory prior to 2020. In fact, all AP science courses except AP Physics 1 had reached five-year highs in 2019. Physics had actually achieved that the year prior. In reviewing our student performances the last couple of years, we do feel the pandemic has played a role. <clears throat> Why? Well, this may be because of fewer labs and hands-on activities, as well as the changes in the testing practices that the College Board has adopted to increase their levels of security for the online tests. We're hoping that as we return to normalcy, our AP scores will follow suit. Of course, the pandemic also brought positive change to GHS and to the Science Department, one positive outcome of the pandemic has been increased use of online resources. Of note is the Explore Learning platform, 
which provides our students with online lab investigations that challenge them to think critically. This platform happens to align very well with NGSS as well. <clears throat> Teachers are continuing to use online resources at a much higher rate and through professional development and collaborative meetings, our staff continues to share and explore with each other. Ultimately, however, online resources cannot replace hands-on hands -on classroom labs and activities. It's wonderful to see that students in our classrooms are once again engaged in labs and investigations at the frequency that they were pre-pandemic. Our goal in the GHS Science Department in the upcoming year is to continue to monitor the implementation of our curriculum, as well as to review the curricula and electives outside of the NGSS sequence of classes. <clears throat> One final note in the success of GHS is our science research program. Greenwich High School continues to hold one of the most successful high school research programs in the country. 2021 was no exception. <clears throat> Students from Greenwich High School were awarded over $150,000 in scholarships and prizes for their accomplishments. While the successes for Greenwich High School are far reaching, here are some of the highlights. Four of our students were selected amongst the 300 scholars in the 2021 Regeneron Science Talent Search, the nation's most prestigious science competition. Amazingly, two of the four that were select, two of these four were selected as finalists, each earning an additional $25,000. It's important to note that no other high school in the country, be it public, private, or specialized in science, had two finalists amongst the 40 most talented science students nationally. The two students were featured on NPR, NBC Nightly News, and Forbes Magazine. In fact, one of these finalists began his GHS journey in the ESL program, which speaks volumes about the opportunities that GHS offers to all students who wish to affect positive change. This alone would be an incredible year for GHS research. However, there are more accolades to share. At the 2021 Connecticut Junior Science and Humanities Symposium, three of the five Connecticut students invited to compete at the national level were from Greenwich High School. Days later at the 2021 Connecticut Science and Engineering Fair, 14 Greenwich High School students were invited as finalists to compete for top prizes and awards. Our students essentially swept all of the top awards. As you can imagine, there are plenty more accolades to share about our science research program. We simply don't have the time. Luckily, they have been, those details have been provided in the report. Um, I think now it's my pleasure to introduce Andrew Byrne. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Chair Stowe, Board of Education members, and Dr. Jones. My name is Andrew Byrne, and it is my pleasure to report out on the GHS Math and Computer Science Departments. During this pivotal year, the department has been working diligently to understand the impact of the pandemic on our students and to support them with the acquisition of skills and concepts, and to continue to de develop our students as problem solvers and critical thinkers. To that end, we have dedicated professional learning time to reviewing pre-assessment data and conducting course pacing audits to ensure that we are delivering an accessible and robust learning experience to all our students. Next slide, please. Building off the success of the K-8 adoption of big ideas, the GHS math department is looking forward to refreshing its Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2 resources. A Greenwich High School math textbook committee has been formed with representatives from the Board of Ed, District and Building, building Administrators, Parents, Special Education, ELL, Literacy, Educators, Students, and members of our own department. The committee began working in November and looks forward to sharing the results with the board in the coming months. This has been a very inclusive and transparent process. A running summary of the committee's work can be located by visiting the website that's posted on this slide. The department is grateful to the board, Dr. Jones and Dr. Carabello for supporting the work of the Greenwich High School Math Department. And we look forward to sharing our research with the board later this school year. Thank you. Any questions? I think so. Let us uh, <laughs> sit down. I think we could bounce all over the place. I don't know if we have to do it by elementary or high school, just have at it. Any 
questions? No? Okay, Michael Joseph. Well, so first of all, thank you. The, um, I mean, I, I think the enthusiasm that, that all of you uh, bring to the presentation was, 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 really, was really clear and, and, I, and I appreciate it. I think it is, um, what is this, my fourth meeting, third meeting? I don't know, it seems like 20. They, um, but, it's, but it is the first meeting where we're really talking, um, able to really talk about teaching and learning, you know, and it's no fault of us, we had to deal with a budget, but it's refreshing and it's important. And I think that's, 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 that's great. Um, it is, um, <clears throat> um, I think as we get into talking more about the strategic plan and role of stretch goals and smart goals and things like that, um, I, I am hopeful that um, these presentations um, in the future, um, just what you heard from, from PTAC earlier, will be grounded a little more in student performance data and how we're seeing uh, benchmark growth and all students grow. I understand right now we're in a transition, so I don't expect that now, but, but, but I, I'm hopeful that we'll see that paradigm shift. The other, the other paradigm shift that, that, that um, was alluded to, um, but I, I, and, and I know it's in the back of people's heads, but I think it's important to, to, to highlight, you know, we, 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 a few times you heard the phrase on ramps used the, um, and I think that's, that, that's critically important when we're talking about um, different levels um, and different courses. Uh, we're talking, you know, just as much as the conversation is about the enrichment that's happening for an advanced students and how we're pushing them ahead. The, um, um, we need to be talking about how in those other classes, we're bridging the gap. Like the, um, where is it? So for example, in those two sixth grade science sections, the, um, where is it that the, those, those, those gaps can be um, accelerated for both students? So more of those students can be in the other section uh, of seventh grade. The, um, I, I think we need to try as much as we can to move away from um, a paradigm of sorting students. I'm not saying we are, that, that I'm not saying you're presenting that. But the more we can think about bridging those gaps and making sure, the other thing I worry about is making sure that all courses have those rich, uh, have enrichment and have those rich inquiry-based, problem-based um, experiences. I worry when I hear about all these exciting experiences at the advanced level and not at other levels. We just want to make sure that we're not falling into a, a trap there. I don't think we are. The um, but that's 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 my one concern as we as we, as, as we talk about these things uh, moving forward. I think I can just comment back on that for a moment and say thank you to Mr. Mercanthy Anthony and the um, idea of on ramps and allowing students to um, meet their. Exp their potential growth at any level within middle school is so important for us. And I think that's really strongly aligned with Dr. Jones's philosophy. And as a new coordinator in discussing these plans with her for advanced science shifts, I think that it became immediately clear that that's an important shift that we want to ensure that students are able to find success in their class. And then should they grow in a placement that they're in, that we give them that opportunity to grow and that we provide teachers with the uh, know how of how to how to figure out if that student is ready to move forward and and how what are those look for's and how are we going to move that st student forward so I'm glad to hear that our philosophies are aligning there. Ms. Hirsch. Well, first of all, I just wanted to uh, uh, you know say uh, follow with uh, what uh, Mr. Mercanti had said, uh, Doctor. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> Um, just call I should again. just go back to just calling you Mike, but anyway, I, 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 I did ask to have that fixed. Anyway, but um, <laughs> I, I was going to say anyway, you know, your enthusiasm and your focus and dedication on on our students um, really comes through in the when you're giving these presentations. Um, but I also wanted to agree with Dr. Mike um, in saying that I, I'm hoping that the next time we see this, we get to see some more. Uh, data to sort of see where the growth is. Um, I know that we are in our third, arguably not really third year uh, for the NGSS uh, type of you know aligned curriculum at the middle schools. And I'm really sort of hoping to see where we 
where we really are with that. Um, the first year we were interrupted with COVID and it's, it's been a weird two years since. Um, but I wanted to ask one more quick question about the differences between on-level and advanced science. Um, is this what you are looking forward to doing for next year and beyond? I know we were uh, gonna revamp the advanced curriculum. Um, Cause it says right now, just for instance, 6A, it mirrors the six, grade six curriculum with advanced resources and enrichment, which is kind of what it was when uh, my children were in middle school. It was just the same curriculum, but deeper. So I didn't know if this is what we're looking to do now, or this is what we're looking to, to do in the future uh, if, if for next year, or we're reworking something going forward. This is for next year. And after conversations with teachers, with students, with parents, and hearing that advanced science meant deeper or faster or longer, what we wanted to ensure that we do is we tease out exactly what activities are different in the advanced curriculum. So there'll be different overviews. There'll be different guides for parents to view online. There'll be specific places within each performance expectation that students are mastering where there is documents or assignments or readings or activities that on-level students do, and then an advanced version for students who are in the advanced sections do separately. So there will be a delineated tasks for that level. So just to confirm, it will be the exact same curriculum between six and six A, seven, seven A, but the, the advanced class is just gonna go deeper with additional performance tasks. I get away from saying the exact same curriculum because you're you're covering the same performance expectations. Yes, we've mapped out those PEs. There's X amount in each grade level and we keep the same amount in sixth and seventh grade for the advanced course, but they are engaging in different learning activities to meet their advanced learner needs. What we also are doing are adding some of those eighth grade performance expectations that they will not be getting because that eighth grade advanced course is using some of the high school performance expectations. We'll be teasing those out and using them in these seminar activities to ensure that by the end of eighth grade, all students still experience all middle school performance expectations and our advanced learners in eighth grade get this robust high school S experience. I would love to have a further discussion, not this evening. Maybe I'll make an appointment to come in because this is exactly the way we had advanced science before COVID. <laughs> and it was exactly what for years the Board of Ed was saying we wanted, we didn't want. We wanted it to have its own curriculum. And I understand going back to this for next year may be the appropriate manner while we are building another curriculum. But I just love to see what, just sit down with you just to hear about what in reality the, the main differences are because I, I, I feel, I'm afraid we may be going back to exactly what we had before, which was what the board had asked repeatedly not to have. <laughs> Yeah, we can definitely follow up with more uh, yeah. conversations. And it may just be that I'm reading this incorrectly and that may be the case, but I, I just am hoping to, uh, to get a little more information. Uh, yeah, could I add to that? I'm gonna call on myself here. Because um, Karen, you hit on something there. Um, it's funny because what I can tell you right now in the middle school, and thankfully you recognize that and you took the board feedback on this loud and clear is that the advanced pathway is not being received well, it's just extra homework that um, the children are doing on their own um, at night. And um, while I really enjoy my daughter's project, I uh, don't think it's probably the appropriate way for them to be learning. So I'm happy that we're delineating again and we're gonna have six and six A separate. And I like that we're coming up with the seminar concept. Having said that, I agree. I wanna make sure that um, we're not just going back. We're this is the right interim step, I guess, but I'd like to know what the long-term goal is because I don't want it to go back to, it's better than it is this year. It sounds like we're going to go back to the pre-COVID scenario, but um, you're right, the prior, I guess we're now going back three years, that also didn't seem to be uh, perfectly what the board was looking at. Um, and I realize these things repeat itself and that's kind of why I'm gonna go to, it sort of leads to my next question, which I find ironic is that we're looking at science in the th grades three to five now being separate again from math and reading and it being, it's something, you know, it's that you can matriculate into that on its own, which I'm really happy to see. But it's also just funny because as I look at my freshman in high school, that's exactly what it was like when he was there. My middle school kid, it was different. And now for my fourth grader, it's different yet again. So. I, I, we're trying different things. 
Um, but let's sort of learn from maybe the fact that this is, we're basically going back to where we were six years ago. I actually think if I look at just my personal experience, it was the best of those because it, you're right, it was, you can be really advanced in science, but perhaps not as advanced in math and reading and they don't all need to be connected. Um, so I'm excited about that change, but maybe we should also, and I see Bonnie on here, um, if she could add a little bit about specifically what's happening there, maybe a little bit more about how we're testing to get into that program and just um, how it's going to be unique again. I'm not sure if Bonnie's elevated to a speaker right now, but I can share about the testing protocols. The testing to enter into uh, the ALP science for grade three will be the NWEA science test and the COGAT composite, meaning there's a verbal and quantitative factor there. So those two or three assessments will be used for placement. And then it's going to somehow be separate from the STEM block that we've now created for ALP, or can you explain that to me a little bit? Correct. So the science portion of the STEM block within the ALP classroom will be the last 30 minutes. So students who are on level for science will return back to their on level classroom, homeroom, and students who are ALP for science, but not for math will then trickle into the ALP classroom. It is an extra transition and we understand that and we have determined as a team that it's worthwhile for our students who have a propensity towards science or the natural world or curiosity about engineering, be in a class with their like minded peers for that time. Understood. I think, I think I see Bonnie elevated now, isn't she? Yes, I'm elevated now. <laughs> yeah, Bonnie, so can you tell me, is this base, are we basically going back to where we were sort of six years ago? Uh, similar to where we were before the adoption of um, NGSS, with the exception of at that point in time, we were enrichment only. With this new one, we will be replacement of their science. So the ALP science teacher will be teaching all of the science curriculum and not just enrichment and an ad, it won't be an ad additional. Got it, understood. Okay, that's a, I, that's a good change. Thank you. Did you have any other questions about the placement processes or did Tarek, I didn't hear what Tara said because I was transitioning. No, I think I'm, um good there, but stay on in case there are other questions because there are hands going up. So um, yes, Ms. Downey, sorry. Um, hi, I just, uh, this wasn't necessarily for Bonnie, I may be more for Tara. Um, at one point in the presentation, I was just, uh, maybe I misunderstood it. It talked about movement, you know, kids advancing, um, kind of the pathways going from advanced from sixth to seventh or seventh to eighth. But did you sit, make reference to that there's movement within a school year? Am I, did I hear it right? Or I'm just trying to understand how that would work if so yeah we never want to prevent a student from being um, placed into a class where their needs are being met so with principal school counselor teacher parent conversation within a, a meeting of all stakeholders a student can be moved into an advanced course should they need to, to should that need to happen okay great thank you um that's i think it's great um and just to john deluca i think it's fabulous that 82 percent of the kids um, met the NGSS standard. What was our goal, by the way? Like we say it was 82%, but what was our target number when, when we had that? Do, do we know? My target was to, to do better than the previous year. So I suppose we didn't quite get there, but uh, given the year that we had last year, uh, I was pretty happy to be. No, it's, a, it's an excellent number. I just didn't know what I wanted to say, like if our goal was only whatever, 70% or whatever. So, so next year we'll have 83%. You know, I, we, we really haven't, it, it, we've, it's, it's been a, a moving target because the first year was 2019, it was canceled in 2020. And so we're, we're still trying to get a handle on um, where we are with this. And that, that'll probably take a year or two more of data before we can start setting some goals like that. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Kowalski. So with the 82% on the NGSS standard, was that just for high school? Th that was our high school number, yes. So do we have a comparable number for K through eight? We do have a number for uh, six through eight, so the eighth grade test, and then K to five, which would be the fifth grade test. For 2019 okay. in grade eight, it was 68%. 
and then in 2020 it was 63 percent sorry 2021 and then in 2019 for k5 it was 75 percent and for 21 it was 67 percent so based upon those numbers you said you hope to see improvement do you have a goal that's set on where you'd like to see those numbers after this year we need more information about the ngss test and norms around that test before i can feel confident to set a numerical goal we did see minor backslides from 2019 to 2021 but as mr deluca described this is only two years of testing data we don't have a strong enough trend where i'd feel comfortable putting a number out right now, but I'd be happy to follow up in more conversations and more research across future or aligned districts and looking at similar tests in other states before coming up with that goal. Does the state of Connecticut have a particular standard and where do we rank with respect to other dis school districts? So unfortunately for this year, the 2021, they did not give us a data set where we could rank across other districts based on that those COVID restrictions of the testing. So we don't have that for our most recent data set. I also just want to remind you that when we presented the assessment report, um, it was very clear guidance from the state that we should not be putting up comparable uh, data sets, given the fact that we had kids testing in various settings. So uh, although there is data uh, available to us, I wouldn't categorize it as the cleanest of data. Uh, and as Tara referenced, three years makes a trend, and we are um, very much looking forward to having our kids go through the assessment process this year and analyzing what I, what I view as much more clean data. Um, and, and to Dr. Mercanti's point, I'm really looking forward to our retreat because the strategic plan desperately needs to have through lines back to each individual school's uh, school improvement plan where we do set uh, academic SMART goals in both areas, and in fact, in all three areas uh, of what we test. So very important conversation coming up in February for us. I had a, a couple of questions regarding the, the report that was sent. There's a comment in here that says, quarter one observations have shown that some students are grappling with cognitive and executive functioning demands of project-based learning this school year. There's a consensus that these initial challenges are in part attributed to gaps in student and social emotional maturity. And it goes on. What do you mean by that? As we transition in out of our COVID uh, constraints of last year, and we have these, these students who are sort of in this COVID bubble, our current sixth graders, we are noticing that project-based learning, which is the curriculum approach we have at the middle school level to achieve all of our performance expectation, does require a heavy cognitive load for our students to be able to navigate between content, skill, and process, or the lens in which we're asking them to think. And that was just noted by my teachers and in my own classroom visits, that the project-based learning and how it may have been more successful pre-COVID, they're just anecdotally noting that that's what's happening with the students in their classrooms right now. So what's being done to address it? We're looking closely at the curriculum each time. And the first thing we did was increase a bit of flexibility within our pacing and allow our teachers a little bit of extra time to go back and look at those science and engineering practices and instruct our students explicitly within grade six. Some of my sixth grade teachers have been asking whether or not it is appropriate for them to start off with a launch unit that goes over a brief overview. As you know, we have 11 elementary schools that funnel into three middle schools and each student, well, my goal over the next few years is to ensure that we're aligned and our curriculum is implemented with fidelity. That's one of my strategic levers for change. But at this point, we do have a myriad of skills entering our sixth grade classrooms. So I'm allowing my teachers the flexibility to meet their students' needs where they are right now. Another question from the report says, um, specialized supports for schools with historically disadvantaged students, and it gives a one, two, and three. Can you just provide some additional color on what you mean by uh, providing specialized supports? And, what's, and, and does that mean disadvantaged students across all the schools that are being identified? Are they being identified or is it specifically targeting schools um, on within GPS? 
while I won't call out any schools on a name by name basis, I will say that we have schools with higher populations of students who are historically disadvantaged, either socioeconomically or racially. And what I'm doing at schools that have those high populations is I'm working with teachers in grade level planning sessions. I'm working with administrators on walkthroughs and I'm developing plans for program meetings to help with teacher content efficacy, as well as learning and teaching strategies for them within the NGSS. Is that because they have lower scores? Yes. Are you taking a break here? Because I had a question. Okay. Um, just real fast, I just wanted to say, um, I don't want to leave math off because we're focused a lot on science. I think it's maybe because we all, math is, has like a more established um, order. So it's probably, at least for me, it's easier to follow. Um, but I, I'm really excited to see, especially in eighth grade, how we're pushing our science students to start going into the high school material, because to me, that's what we've been doing in math for a while. And I think it's um, really valuable and we see the results as the kids come through the high school. So I'm um, really excited that you're sort of, to me, I, maybe it's the wrong analogy, but you're bringing that sort of that same concept into science. Um, feel free to comment, but I said, I wanted to ask one math question just so we don't leave the math people hanging. Um, and that is something that was actually, I think mentioned in public comment earlier tonight is that I do recall we used to have this goal. I think the person said it was 75%. I actually remember it being 80% of kids reaching algebra one by eighth grade. Is that something we're still tracking to or do we have a different goal within the math um, just to sort of use the same concepts that we were talking about in science? You know, we haven't lost sight of that goal. In fact, we have, met, we have conversations quite often, Mr. Reed and I on attaining that goal and all things considered with the new adoption, of the Big Ideas platform, uh, we feel very encouraged, and I'll let Mike speak to this in more detail, uh, that we will exceed that goal uh, this year. So it, um, is the question, what is the percentage of students that we have in algebra, or what is the percentage that are going to meet with success in algebra? <laughs> I guess I'd like the answer to both, and then what the goal is. If it's still 75, is it 80? I, I can't recall. Yeah, so um, the actual goal itself, I believe, is, is to have 75 or more. Um, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but I do know it, it is above 75%. Um, looking at our Linkit scores that are coming through, um, um, you know, not completely finished with the window yet for Form B, um, all of our scores are actually trending quite nicely um, based on the limited data set that I have. The window closes on uh, January 28th. So we don't have all of the data in just quite yet. But if I, when I look at it um, comprehensively from two through eight, because that's where we're giving those assessments, um, you know, um, pretty much every grade level is above, or sorry, every grade level is above 50% um, with the content at this point. So, um, I, I feel like, you know, my hypothesis was that it would take a, a couple of years to see the, the, um, the, the benefits of our new program and the continuity of it. But um, I, I feel like, um, you know, these scores are actually trending higher than I, than I would have supposed. Um, so I'm, I'm actually pretty happy about that. Um, so we do have more than 75% of our kids in um, algebra um, and um, how they're performing to date. Um, I'll actually have a better idea of that because they'll be um, giving their midterms um, uh, at the end of next week um, in, in preparation um, to, to get ready for high school placement and things like that. So um, I'll have a better idea of actually how we're doing in that regard after those midterms are finished up before February break. Got it. That's great. Thank you. Um, sorry, another question coming. Ms. Hirsch. Uh, as a follow-up to Ms. Stowe, since we focus so much on science, I had a quick question for Mr. Byrne. Um, well, first of all, I would also just like to state that I'm so glad that all of the hard work that went into picking Big Ideas Math and the reason that we, uh, the, the committee selected it and the board approved it, um, it is showing back uh, in, in positive work for our students. 
it's really because it was such a great program and, and I'm so thrilled to hear that the students are receiving it well and, and actually doing so well, which takes me to my next question. So if our students really are going to be able to meet and exceed the goal of how many students we're having in algebra, uh, I know we're looking at some new textbooks for the high school, but this is a question for Mr. Burns. So we find that a lot of students now uh, at our middle school are advancing beyond the middle school levels, even double jump or triple jump in math and coming into the high school triple jumped. Um, and I was just sort of wondering what we're looking at um, for goals or, or, or going forward, you know, about adding some higher level math, uh, either within our programs or exterior. I don't know if you're still looking at those options for those students who are coming in triple jumped. Um, you know, a lot of them will take AP, BC, Calc in, in, in you know, junior year or, or, or even earlier for some of them. But, um, you know, I, so I'm just uh, curious to, to see what we're, what we're going to be doing for those kids or if we've thought about really where we're gonna go with that. Thank you, Ms. Hirsch, for that question. You know, certainly we're very excited by the work that the middle school is doing right now to encourage students to uh, follow their passion and to really develop as mathematicians. And this is a really great problem for us to have. We, we are fortunate at the high school, as you just alluded to, to uh, have a BC uh, calculus program that's, that's um, far superior to, to anyone around us. Um, and, in addition to that, we, we do have a, a, quite a few students who will then go into advanced calculus, uh, which is an, an offering which we've been able to have roughly two sections for the last number of years. Um, and, and our students are excited to be able to, to sealing out there. Uh, there are a handful of students, just like you alluded to, though, who may be ready for more. And right now, we've been able to meet their needs through independent studies at the generosity of our, of our teachers. Um, generally speaking, the kids are interested in things like linear algebra or multivariable calculus or differential equations. And so they've really taken the ball uh, there to decide which direction they want to go in. But eventually, your point's a good one. We will need to make some decisions as a school and as a district about what other electives we want to offer beyond uh, advanced calc. Um, I, I know you may, may be aware from previous presentations that I've done our, our computer science program is also blossoming. And uh, a lot of these students will also find interest in some of our AP offerings in the computer science field. So right now that need is being met through independent study and computer science, but you're exactly right. We will need to uh, be strategic about some additional offerings in the future. That's fantastic. And, I, and I'm hoping that I see at least some, some line of that in, in our um, course catalog coming up. Cause I know, like I said, there are, there are a lot of students uh, coming into our schools with with higher level math, and if we can direct them to some some additional computer courses or some of these other independent study options, I think it's going to be really fantastic and gives us time to to build something out uh, on our own if 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 and when we need it, which may be sooner than later, <laughs> hopefully. Any other questions, team? Oh, yep, Mr. Kittle. Two comments. Um, one is a sort of a side note, but. If you offer linear algebra is a fantastic course, it'd be great if you offered that. I was a I was a math major um, in college. Uh, just given that these are STEM reports, I just I, I don't want to beat a dead horse with this, but there are a lot of words and not a lot of numbers uh, in the report. And I think the challenge uh, everyone involved in drafting these should challenge themselves to um, make them very crisp in terms of here are the objectives here's where we're tracking here's where we're not here's what we're going to report on next time and it should be numbers heavy especially in a stem report i would just encourage everyone to challenge themselves to how can how can you make it so that uh there's um uh very, that it's a very objective document that comes through yeah i think that would be quite helpful particularly in this area. And obviously we all had questions about where we're headed for improvement and, and of such. Look, the numbers are as they are. And we need to figure out a path to make sure that we're hitting our targets. And I don't want to hide it behind words. I just want the numbers. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Michael Joseph. So the um while while I'm piling while we're piling on here, the um related I think we not related to STEM, but related to academic achievement, I do think we have to have um, the same kind of awareness around literacy. Um, 
um, we know from the achievement data that we saw um, a few months ago, you know, we've got three quarters um, of our third, fourth, fifth graders at, at um, uh, proficiency, you know, in our Title IX, in our, in our Title I schools, it's it's uh, 50%. Um, these are literacy concerns that are only going to continue to bubble up the element. Um, I think it's something as a system we have to address quickly. There is um, a growing national movement around uh, around literacy and early elementary literacy that um, I know uh, many of us are aware of. That's um, a real concern, particularly around the units of study curriculum that we use here in, in Greenwich um, that we really need to look at and talk about ed reports um, called the program um, um, highly problematic in a number of in a number of areas. Um, I only bring it up because I was reading the uh, magnet uh, brochure um, this week, you know, for my own son applying for magnet New Lebanon, which is obviously one of our, you know, um, title schools. The um, New Lebanon was touting the, the curriculum um, as one of the reasons to go to New Lebanon. And that's, I find that, I find that concerning. They, um, particularly given all the criticism that that curriculum has gotten over the last few years. So just as much as we're focused on STEM, particularly in the early literacy, the numbers and the curriculum needs, uh, need, need, needs something we need to look at quickly. Yes, so um, I, I can't remember when we see um, ELA, but obviously um, we don't have to have John and his team address that, that's a different area, but it does remind me um, and I maybe I'll bring it back to policy. I agree with you, Cody, that um, you know, in a STEM report, you should see numbers. But I'm I am the fact that our policy committee, I think it even predates you, Christina. It was I remember a lot of work by Barbara and Gaetan who worked specifically on how they wanted these reports delivered. So just as an aside, I think the administration happens to be following that guidance. Um, so as a result, if we want changes, I think that we, I'm going to refer that back to the policy committee to implement those changes. If you, if the if changes on how we want the, the style reports, of the reports that we're seeing here as it relates okay. to I don't think, subject matter. Okay. Well, I didn't even realize that. <laughs> so there you go. Anyway, um, unless we have any other questions, I think we can let these guys get ready for, uh, teaching our kids tomorrow. Thank you very much. Um, thanks so much for staying with us. Um, with that, let's go to 7D policy. Oh, do you have a question? No. Okay, policy and governance committee policy first read, Ms. Downey. Good night, you know, like we're moving on. Okay, um, I'm not making a motion, right? I'm just gonna present. Um, so basically in front of you is policy, a revised policy 9325 which came about um, through some requests from some board members to look at meeting uh, timing and conduct, primarily relating to reducing the amount of time for each speaker um, and putting in there what is our normal practice of limiting it to one hour um, at the beginning of the meeting and then continuing it at the end of the meeting. Um, the intention was to clean up and streamline. It was not to stifle discussion. Um, it was actually to help enhance having more speakers um, in our limited time frame. Um, I know Ms. Kowalski has a few thoughts on this because she was one of the proponents of discussing it. But um, yeah, I, th I think it's been misconstrued at least in the public comment this evening in terms of what the intention was. Ms. Kowalski, I hand it to you. Sure. So I realized that we have two people in the audience and I assume that there are more on still online. Not many. We've gone from like 170 to 23. So we're losing. We're going to watch quicker. it on videotape. <laughs> All right. So I'll make this good. So certainly I have read all of the emails that have come in and uh, listened to all of the speakers this evening that had concerns with respect to stifling speech. Um, first of all, I would never want to stifle anyone's speech and had, this was never an, an intention of what was discussed in the policy committee regarding this. In fact, the thought process was oftentimes we end up here as a board 
getting public comment for an hour and then having uh, community members who are still on the list that have to wait until the end of our meetings. And as we can, as I'm talking to an empty audience, I can see that oftentimes that people don't often, those people that don't get to talk at the beginning, wait till the end, or then in fact, don't even talk and no one is even listening other than us. And we're the ones that need to hear it. Um, but the community itself is not hearing what they have to say. And oftentimes they can't wait out the long hours of the meeting and that's understandable. So the whole thought process behind this was actually being able to increase the number of people that could speak in an hour and not have people wait until the end of our meeting because it is our business meeting. We do need to have conduct our business and I get it. And if we had public comment, we could, it could probably go on for hours. So at some point there has to be a reasonable cutoff. Um, so when I was doing the math, I was looking at it as, well, we're allowing 30 people to talk as opposed to 20 people to talk in an hour. And that increases 10 people more that get to talk. Now, understandable today, we did not even have a full hour's worth of comment. So that wouldn't happen every time. But I do appreciate the fact that people have something to say and that we they should be heard. I also see a maybe a conflation of issues here, which is the fact that there is a desire by the community to get an immediate response back to their comments to make sure that they are being heard and getting feedback right away. And I do see the importance of that, but that's a separate issue. I get that too. And maybe that's something this board should look at in things going forward as to how we want to address public comment in a way that the community feels that we're listening, we're hearing them, we're trying to work through these issues better, as opposed to eight, nine people with Tony jo with Dr. Jones sitting here, staring at them and not responding. I can realize the frustration in that process. Yeah, and, and following up on that, I mean, the, the problem with having a dialogue during a meeting, first of all, it's then people say you're picking and choosing, you're talking in this one, the other, and then our meeting runs that much longer, right? Which counteracts the whole point of having a one hour public session. Um, so while, uh, while we acknowledge people's frustration, again, they always have the opportunity to email the board, as we all know, and they get responses to their emails. So there is a dialogue in on an email sense. Um, but what it was discussed, it does make to, to me, it, 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 I agree, it makes a lot of sense to get more people in earlier. Um, I do appreciate two minutes as a tough limit. Now we probably have, you know, yeah, if you listen to it, you know, the third minute adding a lot, I know Karen's going to say <laughs> a lot about it. Um, but we're also not saying it's limited to agenda items or non-agenda items. You get your two minutes regardless, right? We're not putting any constraints on what they talk about. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah. you know, it, it, I, it, I don't see how that really stifles free speech. <laughs> I would all say, look, it doesn't, there, there's no, there's nothing in the policy that says that you have to talk about an agenda item that specifically is not in there. And again, I know that there are probably strong opinions across the board and that's great. That's what we're here for. And that's what we're about to talk about. But I do want to make clear and I'll say it again. The intent was not to limit speech. The intent was to make sure we could have more speakers and more voices heard within the hour of public comment, as opposed to those having to wait until the wee hours of the morning at some times so that their voice could be heard in a public setting with no people in a room. And, and we did think it was worthy of a board discussion, which is why that was the other reason. And um, while there, one member of the committee wasn't there and we, we weren't sure how she was gonna vote, but we said, this is a first read and it's a board discussion. And that's why it was appropriate to bring it. So many hands. Okay, I have to admit, I saw Mr. Kelly's first, then I think it was Mr. Kittle, then it was Ms. Costin. Well. You can go first, of course, if you like. I was just going well, to. Well, no, I was just going to say, as a member of the committee, <laughs> sorry, I wasn't sorry. there for the meeting. That's why I had my hand up. So I wasn't sorry, there I for that, that discussion. But I, I can, I can wait. It's fine. 
No, go ahead. She's a member of the committee. You're going to have to let her go first, Mr. Kelly. Go Absolutely. Ahead. Always I'll let Karen go first. But, no, I just, I was not able to attend the meeting. It's the only one I've actually missed. And I am vehemently uh, opposed to limiting, it, to, to cutting down the speech. And, and I will only say this in the fact that I'm probably out of all the members sitting at this table, one of the, uh, one of the people who has spent the most time sitting on the side of that podium and speaking to the board. Um, I know how incredibly difficult it is to make a coherent and cogent argument uh, or discussion points on agenda and oftentimes non-agenda items within a three minute time limit, especially when you have speakers who are nervous up there, it takes some time. They, they, and especially if you have people that come up and address more than one topic. Um, to me, we have one opportunity a month to hear from individuals in the community. Um, and it's exceptionally important that we allow that, that opportunity. Um, I do appreciate that we wanted to add in something that has always been part of our, it was in our, I believe it was in our older policy and somehow got removed. Uh, and then we are adding it back, but it has been on and I went and looked through old, all of our, my old agendas sitting at home from well before I was ever on this board from 2016, 2015, 2014, it always stated that we took an hour uh, of public commentary prior to the meeting and then would refer the rest to the end. In the amount of time that I've spent in this room, uh, well, it's usually at multiple different schools, but often you rarely get more than an hour of public speakers, um, and unless it's a hot button issue. And, and I am thrilled that we have so many members of our community that want to come and speak and, and be heard. Um, and to me, I feel like cutting down that time when most people really make an effort to, to stay within their time time limit. It's very hard for me to, to, uh, to support that. Um, that's just my 10 cent opinion. And, and I'm only one of eight here, but it's never, I, and I understand it was not about limiting free speech. It was about making sure individuals have more opportunity to be heard. Um, but it's not often that we have more than it, you know, it, recently we have, but it's not always often that we have more than an hour and it's just so hard to get everything done in a short window of time. That's all. Mr. Kelly. Thank you. Well, I will say, Karen, I was always amazed watching you jam so many words into three minutes. I was always amazed to was you did that. So that was really cool. But, but uh, I will not throw my colleagues under the school bus here because basically I was privy to those discussions uh, over the years or oh, maybe over the months, whatever it was, about how we could better get more speakers to say their opinion. Now, from our perspective, more is better. But for people, it's human nature. If you take something away from them, you have to give them something. And what we did here, and I, I take responsibility as other board members do, is that we took something from them, looking at it from our perspective, saying, hey, we'll hear more opinions. We'll be able to hear more from our community. But we never gave them anything. So human nature is like, hey, wait a minute, you took something or are trying to take something from us. So, uh, uh, so I do believe that uh, our intentions, I will share those who had spoke to this point, I will share in that decision making where we misread uh, our actions. So I don't think our actions are correct, because I can't think of anything we could give back right now, unless I love that town hall concept. I really do dig that. I think that'd be kind of fun. So can, is it is it possible to actually have an additional gathering by choice? of board members some won't care that for that atmosphere i happen to like that sort of atmosphere so is it by choice can we arrange something like that so we could have a group of people that could throw questions at us we could fire things back at them i would like to look at something like that if that's possible so we've done town halls for various topics right we did it for many times for back to school for covid and then we have done it for security concerns yeah we've done it it's usually topic specific but um, yeah, it's certainly something we've done. Ms. Costin. So um, I, as a former broadcast professional, we deal in milliseconds and you can cut 30 seconds off of your remarks if you just don't thank everybody repeatedly or say happy new year and all of that. Like that's just, you know, you could make it to 30 and, and just cut out all of the extraneous pleasantries, but that aside, you know, the RTM does allow for limiting commentary in its body. If they have a very full agenda, there can be a motion to limit um, comments um, to two minutes. 
and that is not debatable within the body, um, but you do need to vote on whether you are going to limit the commentary and try to fit more people in. So that's what one body in town does. Um, however, I, I would say I would not be in favor of shortening our public comment limits. Uh, Mr. Kittle. Um, yeah, I don't know exactly how I feel about this, but some thoughts I wanted to share. Uh, one is, Joe, to your point of if we have the room to give something back, one thing we might want to consider is I think all of us budget an hour in our minds, regardless of how many speakers there are, or at least I do with my limited experience here. Um, and uh, perhaps a give back is is if there are less than 20 speakers, you could say, hey, you actually can have a, we'll fill up the block, you know, within reason, maybe cap it at five minutes, but if 10 people sign up, then, you know, everybody gets their five minutes. So you're actually getting more time in certain situations. And we only utilize the two minutes if it's allowing extra people to speak. Um, and then maybe you could even, you know, I don't know, they can always put things in writing to us before the meeting. But uh, that was one thing I was thinking about as a give back. Um, after hearing Karen um, speak about her experience talking up there, I found that kind of convincing of just cutting it back further when people take time out of their day to come here. Um, so I don't know, kind of mixed on this, but if the uh, I like the idea of allowing more people to speak because it's terrible when we have people, you know, it's like two people left and they have to sit through all the painful everything else just to say two minutes. Um, so I don't know, it, maybe the other option would be to have a little bit of flexibility on our end that if, you know, there's 40 people that want to speak, cut it down. But if there's um, 21, we just let that last person, we go a little bit over the schedule or whatever. I don't know. So I, I'm undecided. I just wanted to share those thoughts. Yeah, that's good. Um, Mr. Sorry, Michael, Dr. Michael Joseph. So right. I wanted to start. Um, I, I agree with Cody, but first I wanted to start by thanking him and wishing him a happy new year. The, uh, <laughs> the, the um, as well as <laughs> you didn't, you weren't listening to Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I understand. Uh, I understand. I appreciate what the, uh, the, the thinking of the policy committee here, the, um, and their approach in trying to actually try to make the um, um, meeting more participatory by allowing more space. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that um, um, it's, it's the best move right now. I do think though, if we wanna talk about ways to make the meeting um, more productive and more efficient and more engaging and all those things, they, um, I do have, um, I do think there were three, a few things to think about. And one was what Cody just said, the, um, in the policy itself, instead of having this hard and fast hour, it might be worth considering giving the chair a little bit of leeway here. For example, you've got 22 people signed up. Um, do we really need to wait till three hours later for those last two people or can the chair have that kind of discretion or similarly, but if there's 47 signed up, similarly, the chair maybe doesn't want to have that, you know, the chair discretion the other way. But I, I wonder if giving that kind of flexibility in the policy might might be appropriate because yeah most of the time we don't fill the whole hour but if we do that flexibility might be be helpful so that's one the first point the second point the um, um which i'm unclear of is i was talking to dr jones at one point and she she felt it was at least our procedure and I understand that there was definitely a uh, there's a philosophy at the very least of not responding to comment um, and I get that we want to get um, we want to we want to um, we're here to absorb we're here to listen. I think in this day and age, I'm not sure that that philosophy serves us well anymore as, as well. Certainly, if there's misinformation said out there, I think it's incumbent upon us at the public meeting at the end of public comment, not back and forth, but at the end of that period to correct it immediately, because we always have people, particularly in Zoom, tuning in for the first time. Um, and they hear things and they hear something out there, they take it, oh, I didn't know that, that's terrible. Um, we need to correct that immediately, I think. 
Um, but at the same time, I think, you know, it's incumbent upon us to acknowledge concerns and when we can comment, you know, which we all ended up doing around the, the lunch thing anyway. Um, I think that's an important aspect of the meeting that we probably need to, to account for. The, um, I think too often in the past, in past years, when you've had an angry crowd here talking about whatever it was, and then we've moved on to our agenda and haven't said anything at all, it gives the impression of gaslighting. And I don't think that serves, serves as well, in all honesty. So, so I think that's something else to think about in our approach there. And then finally, just real quick, because I've given people this pitch before. You're over two minutes. I'm sorry. Happy New Year. <laughs> my third point. The, uh, my final point, the, uh, I've given this pitch before, the idea of flipping aspects of the meeting. The curriculum is a perfect example of that. Instead of having um, our administrators at 10, I, I timed it, it was at 10.15 at night, giving that presentation, they could easily have recorded that send it to us ahead of time, the whole community would have then been able to see it in a much more effective and efficient way because nobody was here when they were talking. They, they, um, and then our board meeting time could have been spent actually talking about it they, um, and be more productive and efficient. So I think all, all these things might be, oh, there are ways to make these meetings more efficient, I think. So, Ms. Hirsch. I just wanted to acknowledge the uh, two, two comments that were made. Um, one in, again, having spent a lot of time here, uh, in prior years, and I'm sure uh, our one attendee can, can say the same, um, our chair has always had the flexibility. If we looked, you know, we do the math when we see the number of people signed up. Uh, and if there is one or two, uh, there, if there are one or two other individuals waiting to speak, the chair has always uh, had the opportunity to make the motion to extend the, pub, the time for public comment. And we've often done that uh, many years in the past. We've had some seriously heavy agenda items uh, that we need to get through, which is oftentimes, I think, why in the past year or so we haven't been doing that. Um, but you know, that has something the chair has always had the privilege of doing. Uh, and, the, and the same with the chair has always had the privilege. If we have a heavy agenda item, a, a heavy agenda with a lot of um, deep discussion topics to then at that particular meeting, and it's even in the policy now, to limit the speech from three minutes to two minutes, uh, if need be. Um, so that flexibility has always been there. Um, and I know from years past, and even from tonight, uh, when things are addressed, you know, oftentimes the superintendent or members of the board will ask questions or address statements made, or when it is, uh, when individuals are speaking specifically on agenda items, we will bring that up in our discussion. Um, and I personally, I, I really value having the opportunity to hear from the community via email, um, phone calls, hearing from them in a, in a public forum such as this as well, especially when we're uh, having discussions and ma making some decisions because it's important that we represent all different uh, viewpoints. So I, I love that opportunity. Great. Can I just add one thing? Oh, sorry. I was going to give my two cents, but go ahead, Ms. Costin. Are we allowed to go out of order? In other words, this conversation might have been very helpful, like at the beginning of the meeting. <laughs> so we can move agenda items if it's not a special meeting. Um, I think this was listed as a special meet. What are we? Are we back on our regular calendar? This is business. So then we could have, you could make a motion to move agenda items around. Um, I think that this was put here because we had to move the, we usually put policy discussion and actions so they go together, but because we had to have Andy come tonight, we moved some things around. Yeah, and this would have been useful for the public to hear. Definitely. Other than Brian. Brian is the public. He can share it widely. Um, Tweet about it. <laughs> so exactly. And by the way, I mean, we are in the world of like, what is it? 104. 40 characters or less and TikTok videos are 30 seconds, but. Um, I can I just, I think it's great that you guys put this policy change forward and that's what the public comment was focused on because if you hadn't, the public comment would have been focused on title nine and we'd still uh, still be in it right now. So. <laughs> to, to be honest with you, if title nine was on the agenda, they, they were, and it's the third time it's been it's on the third agenda. Time third time it's been on the agenda. So, you know, <laughs> people saying no public comment, it was here three times. So just my two cents on this. Um, and this was something that you're right, Joe. Um, I know I was talking about in the policy committee years ago. Um, I think that there were some emails today and then from the public that felt that this was a reflection of <laughs> this particular group. And I can assure you that this is, 
this is, I mean, I hate to say it, but this is a pretty light group in the now five years I've been on the board. There was school start time that people are going to forget about. Um, special education, um, the advanced learning program. Give me something else. I, FERB. Um, racial balance. Racial balance. Yeah, that's FERB. Yeah. So um, redistricting. <laughs> Let's go back through all of the years that, um, believe me, we have a lot of an engaged community and I think that's awesome. Um, so the real goal here, I know, um, and I was even a, I was an advocate for it, but I love all this, this, this discussion, is I saw this as an opportunity to give more people a chance to speak, um, especially because when we do have like a 40 speaker list, which we have had, and I've had working parents reach out to me sort of saying, I really, really wanted to talk tonight, but I just couldn't hang on until 11 o'clock because I had to get up in the morning and go to work. And, um, and I, I get that. And um, for some reason, I don't require as much sleep. But I, I think that that was the goal here was to try to actually hear from more people ahead of our agenda, so that we could be informed when dealing with the topics. And it, it, it was actually meant to be more engaging, more transparent, more communication. So I, it's ironic that um, it was taken any other way, but it was actually meant to be a really, really positive thing. Um, but that's, that's okay. Um, that's why it's good. It's a first read and then we're having this conversation. We can, we can continue. I also like your idea of having some flexibility. The only thing I worry about with that is that if I ever made a call to go from three minutes to two minutes for some people that are more scripted, like I'm, as you can see, I'm very off the cuff person. So that would be okay for me. But there are some I, people. I, I think I, I would actually that. think that you can't tell people they have three minutes and they should show up and they've got two and you know you, you, you could give it to say you got two and you get five when, when that's we, a different problem you know when do we know how many speakers there are noon. until noon of that day so can we tell them at noon that day hey there's a big roster so i guess you also, could, 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 i'll give it to you karen would you be able to you also, at that point I, I have had to it has happened before where they cut the time down and i've had to sit in the audience and cut stuff and pull stuff out. And yes, it's often the thank yous uh, and whatever else. But being said, we also have to remember the fact that prior to COVID, we didn't have public, you know, online sign up. People would show up at the meeting and they had to sign up when they got here to speak. We may be very well when COVID's done going back to that or having the opportunity to have people tune in via this, you know, Zoom, but come here to speak to us because it's really a much better opportunity for us to have somebody face to face to hear from them instead of hearing from from zoom so for those of you who are new to this you used to have to i mean i remember rushing here because you wanted to be one of the first speakers to sign up on a topic and you'd be like running through the door to like sign up and there was a line of people out the door waiting to sign up it always was you signed up for agenda non-agenda it was all but you had to be here to have that um, opportunity so we are in a different mode now with with having zoom but oh yes we had people stay here till one in the morning when meetings used to go to one in the morning waiting to speak we're tracking there okay go ahead i think Responsive. i actually think we should go back you know that that timely cutoff is if you know it does restrict speech if somebody forgot to sign up at noon by noon on the day of then all of a sudden they're out of luck so I welcome the opportunity when we can just have the sign up sheet. And I do remember those days that right outside the door and we grab it and they had to, in fact, I think I remember you had to put your name and what you're going to talk about. Um, and your address and your and address, address. or email, them. whatever. So I think, uh, you know, and I welcome th that back as, as well. Again, I think this is a really healthy discussion and I think it's a healthy discussion in a way that we're trying to figure out the best way to give the community all the opportunity in the world to come and talk to us, as well as trying to figure out a way, the best way to respond and be responsive and make and understand that we are hearing them, um, as opposed to us just saying that, that they're actually feeling that as well. So I just I want to continue the discussion. I do think, you know, we can take this back to policy committee and kind of take everybody's thoughts. I'm not sure where we'd land at this point, but I might have to watch the video myself on all of this, but I know you did. 
So, but I do think we need to come up with something. Um, well, obviously it's clearly not this, it's gotta be a variation of it and a working pro. And I think it's just a work in progress. Agreed. So with that, we'll bring it back to policy and then we'll have this come back to us when policy has a good solution. Um, so with that, I am putting on the next action item on the table. It's uh, Thank you. Um, making a motion to approve the 2022-2023 Board of Education meeting calendar. Do I have a second? Okay, thank you, Ms. Cole. We are ready. Um, well, Dr. Jones, let me turn it over to Dr. Jones and she could tell you what, what she changed. Um, there were there were two requests um, from the last meeting. One was to add a meeting in October. So that is uh, reflected in here. Um, there was a request to perhaps look at March or April April, but when I went back through my notes, there was not necessarily a consensus. And uh, when we had our executive meeting, uh, we did discuss we can always add a meeting, but it's difficult. It's not difficult. We could do it now, but we would rather add than be canceling a meeting because of the budget calendars that fall during that same time, uh, because all of you have a lot of meetings during March, April. Michael Jones. So I guess my question was more less about amending the dates as far as amending the topics, if that's something, uh, how that works, if that's something we can do or not do, or what's that? That's done in policy. They come up with the plan, but you should always yeah, provide feedback on how, when do you work to that? We, 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 we set the uh, agenda, the calendar agenda, usually in the spring. Oh, no, 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 no. The opposite not amending the dates i meant amending the topics that are uh, right the topics like the policy committee with the with the chair or the i think policy i i and dr jones put the calendar takes her calendar dates and adds the topics to it in, and i think we vote on it in june so it's usually done in like april may so you have time so if we wanted to add an agenda item so for example the um we talked at the executive session last time about having an executive session um later you know next month so they to bring the high school leadership back about to follow up on the um, um the lockdown incident the um how would we go about adding that to the, this this agenda plan for example well you can we can talk about you would talk about that in no this is the long-term calendar like i would draw my comments we're going to get to that in like five minutes, hopefully. Um, so me, I, I think this is a good addition. Um, I think that it was wise not to put anything in there yet for the spring because the spring always gets so loaded up with budget uh, meetings with the BET and the RTM, um, but we could always, of course, add. So um, let's take this to a vote unless I see any other discussion. Okay, all in favor of the 2022-2023 Board of Ed meeting calendar. That passes eight zero. Thank you very much. I'm now gonna put on the table um, approving the financial and staffing report. Can I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Downey. Okay. And Mr. O'Keefe. Hi everybody. Uh, so as of December 31st, our operating plan uh, actuals are at $70.2 million. It's 40.8% attainment of our full year budget of 171.9. Uh, that compares to 42% attainment in the prior year period. So we're a little bit uh, better than the attainment uh, last year. But some of that is explainable with transportation expense. Um, on a year to year basis, uh, we're up 1.6 million or 2.4%. Uh, drivers of the year to year growth salaries are up $800,000 or about 1.4%. Supplies are up 1.4 million or 76, uh, 79%. And that's, uh, again, as I mentioned in the last couple of months, the, uh, the year to year impact of the reduced level of spending in the first half of last year, which was the result of that pre spend activity that occurred at year end in, in full year 20. Uh, and then uh, services overall are down 700,000, and that's uh, driven by uh, late transportation billings. So that should self-correct, um, you know, in the next couple of months. Uh, on capital, 
uh, overall our capital available balances uh, $27.2 million as of January 4th, um, which is down about 200K from the November financial report. Of that 27.2 balance, 12.1 uh, of it is from older projects, so prior to full year 22, and is down about a half a million since the November report. And uh, from last September, we're down about uh, $16 million or about 57%. So we're really making progress as, as is our goal to uh, really knock out the older projects uh, in a quicker pace. Uh, also in the in the overall balance is two and a half million from building committee projects. So there's four projects, New Lab, Glenville, Mesa, and Hamilton Avenue. And they're all multi-year projects, but they're all pretty much, they're all finished. We're just waiting to close them out uh, with the audit from the state. So once we do that, uh, we'll be able to take that off the available balance. Food services, uh, it's kind of a repeat. Um, Still early, early to say where we're going to be, but we are. Uh, we will underrun our our cash sales budget. There's no doubt about that, and we will significantly uh, overrun our um, our state reimbursements. The state reimbursements are coming in very strong, um, so it's it's it's. I think we're going to exceed uh, state reimbursements by a really significant amount. On expenses, uh, we're expecting that we'll underrun budget uh, by a small amount in salaries and in food costs. Um, and, uh, and as far as unbudgeted transportation costs, we will recover that from grants. Um, so, and, uh, and that's it for the uh, report. Ms. Kowalski. So Sean, the, sorry for the probably naive question, but what are the old product projects in the capital that haven't gotten done? Like, what are we waiting and what's the, like, why are they taking so long? Uh, they're, you know, like windows projects, which take time. Uh, they're typically multi-year projects that, uh, you know, we can only work on the, in, during the summers. So there are projects that are not major projects that are multi-year in nature. So that's the general reason for things not to be completed. Also, one other reason is that there could be uh, a, a bundled set of projects and which, you know, some of these projects can be completed, but we cannot close them out until we finish the other bundled projects within that bundle. So that is a, a reason for it as well. Those are the two major reasons. So then the question is, have we paid on this or is this money that's sitting in an account? uh let's say that again or have we paid? right so for example when we say when you say for example we're currently at 27.2 million which is a drawdown have we already paid so is that 27 million sitting in a in a bank account that gps runs or have we already paid the contractor that money and we're waiting for him to complete the project that 27 million is totally free and clear has not been encumbered or spent so this is, are we making interest on that money and what's happening to that interest? And, and if we're not spending it, why aren't we investing it and make, turning it into something until we're paying out on it? I mean, I just think that that's a logical way to handle it, but I, I don't know where the money sits. I, I'd have, that's really a town question. They, they handle the- uh, yeah, It sits with the town. We're just, remember, we're like an, an, a, a division of the town. So we don't run our own- finances it's not like but, we're investing our money so the town is the town is the bt owns the money. You know, it depends on where um you know that could be could be you know low interest bonds uh you know low risk activity uh, that they'll probably make a, a nominal amount of money on so i'll direct that question to dan ozimir since he's the new chair of the bet and say what's happening to it because i'm just curious that would be the right channel. Anything else here? Okay, seeing none. Um, the motion on the table was approving the financial report for the period ended December 31, 2021. All in favor? That passes 8 0.
Okay, thank you. We are now on to, and Michael Joseph, you are up, agenda planning. So I had a couple, thank you. Happy New Year. They, um, so I had- Thank a, you. <laughs> so um, I had three three thoughts on possible agenda topics. So one, as you, as I already mentioned on the previous issue, um, I'm bringing back an executive function to hear executive session to talk about, um, to hear from the high school leadership on um, changes they made to their procedures. They uh, was something we said we, we, we hope to do. Um, probably would have to be executive. <laughs> the other suggestion um, I had was um, if we could consider, um, given the hope, hopeful, the hope for strategic plan guideline, consider the um, June retreat, um, the board discussion is scheduled for the June business meeting. Um, right now, board goals are scheduled for the June business meeting. If we could move that to the June retreat, in the hopes that then we act upon them at the June business meeting, if that makes sense. So we have a discussion of board goals at the June retreat and then action on at the June business meeting. Right now, I think, now right now it, we don't talk about it till the June business meeting. No, so on June 2nd, info, current board goals and self-evaluation. And then on June 16th, it's the action. Yes, would be my suggestion. That's, that's how it's laid out. Have we changed it? Okay. Actually, I don't see the action. I see the info. It's just yeah. the opposite. Right. No, that's what I mean. Instead of the info, you move that to the retreat. You move that to June second. Good point. Was changing and all. We that. didn't do the goals this year. That's a good point. Because the board was changing, so that's not even. Happening. You're saying so the board goals that are on for June 2nd for info, we would keep, but then just add the action item. Is that what you're saying, Mike? Except we don't have any board goals. You say to look at board goals for next year. No, he's got for next year. It's in there for June 2nd. Yeah, that, that was current, but we should do it for future. We should take it as a, okay, to pivot to making the retreat for future goals. Got it. Good idea. Okay. Uh, you, you said three. That was number two, right? The oh, okay. Um, what am I missing? I thought there was something else. No, I only have two things written down from you. No, the second, the sixteenth. Oh, okay, fine. Got it. Okay. Um, and then I think if I'm correct, off on February third, we could remove. The Cardinal Stadium Safety Road adds facts because it looks like we are good there. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Yeah. Karen? One, do we have this course study guide that was presented tonight? Do we have that on for an action item? Oh, it's on for February 24th. Okay. It is on February 24th. The other thing that I would suggest is. I am going to be presumptuous that the mask mandate, mask executive order will be lifted and we should put that on the calendar to deal with that as soon as possible. So why not go ahead and put that on for February 24th? Because that wouldn't be within a week if it went off on the 15th. So we'd have to call a special meeting. We would have to, yep. Okay. Yes, and it's right in the middle of vacation. Good point. But yeah, we'll see. I mean, she's saying she's, we're hearing that they're going to not wait until the 15th. Like they're going to make some sort of decision earlier, but who knows? Which yeah, is, the superintendents in, in the state have requested that. Okay. All right. I just want to be ready. Agreed. All right. Seeing nothing else, can I get a motion? <gasps> Miss Costin. Do I have a second? Okay. All right. Well, and we'll give it to Mr. Kittle. And is that okay with you, Mr. Kelly? We'll give it to you back next time. Okay. All in favor? Eight zero. We are only an hour behind my schedule. Thank you so much. Have a good night.